Welcome back. This is the afternoon so, session of the Safari Seminar. Starting out here in a minute, um, Holly Orr is going to talk to us, and she's got a, a list of frequently asked questions for novices, which most of you in here are novices, so that worked out well. As I said before lunch, Holly has trained um, quite a few of the novice winners over the last 10 years. Um, Holly's finished 13 water safaris, and she currently holds the women's C1 record, and is former record holder um, for the overall women's record and the overall women's solo record. So when, when she speaks, she knows that of which she speaks. Somebody asked me outside, what's the number one thing you need to do this race? I will give you the advice that was given to me in 1984 to have down the Rio Grande. My roommate at the time had won the race in 1983. And I said to him, I said, what do I need to do this race? And he said, an overwhelming desire to hurt yourself. <laughs> and, you know, and I found that to be pretty apt advice over the last 30 odd years. Um, so, if you know, want to know what you need, an overwhelming desire to hurt yourself. With that, I'm going to turn you over to Holly. I'll probably jump in from time to time about different equipment things. And, you know, we've, we've got some good resources here today. Um, Holly also owns um, Paddle with Style, and so she rents boats out, and she um, sells out her own paddles. Uh, some of you were talking to Dwayne from TG Canoe Livery. I think they, they don't rent boats out, but they sell boats, and also sell equipment. Um, anyway, on that list is the different folks that, that, there are other folks that make money off of the water safari. However, they don't contribute back to the race, so the only ones I'm plugging today are the folks who are our sponsors. So, with that, yes? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's some material in the back. I know there's a book for sale about the race. There's some other information, these handouts that Chris has done about team captain stuff. I haven't been able to get the light to change, so. Because I'm not that smart. I should have messed with it during lunch, but. Yeah. I also get tired of people, so I have to go walk around from time to time. So I'm going to turn you over to Holly. All right, guys. So frequently asked questions. Um, some of these might, you probably have in your notebook to ask. Um, when we're talking about certain things, feel free to raise your hand. And then also, those of you who have done the race, can you raise your hand? Because I know we have several. Okay. So when we're talking about like favorite foods and things, that's going to be different for different folks. So. Kristen and Libby and Bob, y'all feel free to jump in there too. So, I don't know how well you can see these, uh, but it's do you sleep? And the answer is maybe. Some people do, some don't. And then how do you sleep? I don't know if you can see this, it's a sleep hammock. We've talked about it's a bit like a spray skirt. So a lot of times one guy will lay back in the boat while the other guy paddles. Do you need a sleep hammock to sleep? No, you can pull over like Andrew here and pass out on the gravel bank. Um, you can also just lay it on your seat. Um, a lot of times I'll get on my knees and I'll put the seat that I'm sitting on like right here on my body and I'll put my water jugs back here and then have a little pad and it's sleeping. It's comfortable after you've been sitting for 50 hours other than that it's not being. Any questions on sleeping? No? Okay. Also, how do you stay awake? That's a big one. How do you stay awake? Well, you can sing, you can do Tarzan reenactments, yelling. Uh, some people do caffeine. If you do caffeine, be careful with that because you will spike and be wide awake and then you'll have a hard crash. Also, I've made the mistake my early years of taking a no-dose without eating food. That doesn't settle very well and you may see that no-dose come up again. So if you do decide to do caffeine, be careful with that. And sleep. Sleep. What do you eat? Okay, guys who've raced before, popcorn style, what is your favorite safari food? Libby? Uh, well, I mean, I do liquid diet, so uh, I guess on the side, either like fruit like watermelon or goldfish or just something quick. So. Okay, so Libby likes mostly liquid spizz? Yep. Okay, so spizz is something a lot of us use. I doctor mine up. Um, who else in here is raised? In the back, well, tell me your favorite foods. Peaches, the little peaches I can. Oh yeah, the little fruit cups. Yes. yes. 
love the fruit cups. <laughs> or Jay's favorite, or Team Pat. I've got that a million times. Maybe uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwich is Jay's favorite. Because he doesn't like to do a lot of wishes. So uh, chips with salt. Okay, chips, cliff bars. I love avocados with salt added to them. Um, I think the main thing with the food is you want a well balanced diet. A lot of the energy food is sugar, sugar, sugar. We want to make sure we balance the electrolytes, the sodium, the potassium, and the carbs and all that together. Would well, protein bar be good? Protein bar? Yeah. Yeah, that could be one. Um, one thing is we always say practice, practice, practice with what you're going to eat during the race. Don't on race morning decide, oh, I want to try such and such. I'll take that in the race. Or, I'll have my team captain give that to me. Um, more than likely, um, that will not go well for you. <coughs> Try something new on during the race if you haven't ever tried in practice. So experiment with what your body can handle. You practice like you want to race because you're going to race like you practice. That goes with clothes. We're going to talk about clothes. That goes with food. Um, so food experiment with. Um, the other thing is you don't want to do the three big meals. You want to do steady food throughout the whole time. There's been a lot of science research on how much your body can metabolize within a given hour. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist. Most people figure to eat like two, 300 calories max per hour. Everybody's body's different. Also, how hard are you working? But for me personally, I'll consume probably like 200 calories every hour. A lot of times it's through a handful of chips or a bite bottle squeeze, uh, but I want to keep my energy level even. And I tell you, at 2 a.m. after I've been paddling 40 something hours, it's tough to eat, but I know I have to eat. Because in the safari, once you go down, it's really hard to get back up. As other races that maybe are 10 or 12 hours long, when you crater, you're, you're almost done. The safari is not that way, so don't let yourself go down. But if you do sleep, and this is real important for team captains, eat before you sleep. So eat before you sleep, and then eat as soon as you wake up, because your body's going to be burning all that off. Okay, the other big question is who sits where in the boat, and what is their responsibility? Who's in the front of the boat? Who's in the back of the boat? Does the guy in the back of the boat only do the steering? The guy in the back of the boat is responsible for the big picture. The guy in the front of the boat, the bow, is responsible for like the here and now. But both ends of the boat are responsible for steering the boat. And there's different draw strokes and things like that you can do. Um, if you're in a multi-man, then a lot of times we rotate seats. That's kind of a little more, is anybody like dead set on going in a big boat? If it's your first year, I, I would advise not to do that. I think we have maybe one or two couple. people that are inter interested in like three person. Okay, well three person, a lot of times you'll, you'll switch around um, positions. Once again, practice what you're going to do. Anything to add on that? Seat positions? It's certainly, you know, it's more difficult in the bow in terms of pure making the boat go forward. Um, however, you know, there's different skill sets. I mean, some people are better boat drivers, some people are better bowmen. You know, some people really only belong in the middle of the boat. Um, the bow is kind of, you're the metronome. Yeah. You're just, you got to hold a nice, even stroke rate. The guy in the back, you want to be on the opposite side of him doing the exact same time. If you were in marching band or playing in music and you got that one person who's out of time, it's the same in the canoe. If somebody's out of time, it's just not as smooth and that means it's not as efficient. And while it's a lot of work, it doesn't have to be, don't make it harder than it has to be, okay? Um, yeah, a lot of what's come natural. The other thing too with the seat position is you wanna make sure the boat is level opposed to, I didn't bring my little canoe, but the seats slide because if I'm racing with my 10-year-old son and I'm in the, in the back of the boat here and he's in the front, the boat's probably going to be doing this. So the sliding seats allow me to slide the seats forward to get the boat level. We want the boat level to maybe slightly bow down um, for shallow water and things like that. So when you, if you are changing seats, when you get your boat, make sure you slide those seats accordingly. Sometimes people 
people put lime on the outside of the boat. An easy way is just put some water in the boat and wherever it runs, you know if your bow is stirred heavy. But you want to aim for, you know, flat to slightly <coughs> bow down. That's going to really help handling the boat. Okay? Anything to add? Questions on who sits where at boat trip? Yeah, the, 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 the more trim your boat is as you go down the river, you know, like Holly said, if you're, if you're stern heavy, especially, wind becomes a major issue. You know, it, it's, it's trying to turn that boat in a regular face. You know, Bob's right, has raced and cruisers quite a bit. You may have something on that as well. Well, also, if you're way too stern down, you're going to drag a too shallow water section down, and you're going to have trouble when you hit the bottom one. So a good rule of thumb is try to level if you can. A little bow down, like she said. But if you're stern heavy, you can turn the boat pretty well. But in shallow water years, you'll also drag out and sucks down in shallow water. So anyway, having the ability to slide those seats is really crucial in, in the trimming boat. The other thing for his comfort is your seat padding. I have seen some people put layers of layers of layers of layers because their butt hurts. When the reality is the seat needed to be adjusted to the level of the seat. Because once again, if you get Dwayne to rig it or Jay to rig it, you know, the seat's probably going to be where it needs to be. If you rig it yourself, it may not. Different pains will come with different seat angles, but we're still on the seat for 100 hours, right? That's a long time to be sitting. A lot of times we'll cut notches in the back of the seat pad, and that allows for the tailbone, the pressure to be released off that tailbone a little bit. Um, I'm a huge fan of that. Um, Y'all like notches? Some people don't care. So I have like a notch. permanent callus on my tailbone, but um, yeah, it's, it, you don't, you know, and it, it depends on how your butt shape. For that matter, if you've got a big butt, your tailbone's not going to be hitting the back of the seat, and you've got a, if you're buttless like I am, you know, you're, you're going to be rubbing, and then it's different for women as well because, you know, my yep. mistake ain't made for making babies. Um, <laughs> and on to the next thing. Okay. Is because you can see 
the teeth depth, they can see if that hose is all the way down. And you don't have to drink around with all the twisting it around through the ice and everything. Yeah. Um, all that mix goes, water goes straight into the top. I'll sound some people put a little like a camelback little valve on the end where you also can use it when you drain. You have to be careful these times because you can drain them out if you're two miles from where you're supposed to get water, that could be a problem. So you have to maybe you put Velcro on where you can stick on the side of the boat or have a harness around your neck where you have Velcro and it'll be right in your mouth. But you got to be careful they will drain out. So Yeah, so if you don't have a bite valve, blow back. <laughs> like blow all empty the hose. Blow some bubbles, helps keep your mix up. I like having Velcro on the end of mine, even if I do have a light up, because man, what's in the bottom of that boat? I don't want my drink hose with dead mayflies and shoe goo and, and people maybe miss when they're peeing out of the boat, you know, all that good stuff. It's kind of special. And then the jug foam, this is a high density foam. Probably give us the exact what it is. It's, um, it's called mini cell foam, and it's, it is the coolest stuff on the planet. You can you can saw it, you can machine it, you can do just about anything you want to with it, and it's significant flotation. So anytime you put a jug holder, or pill holder, or, or whatever in with that, um, it adds to the flotation of your boat. Plus. Um, it doesn't weigh much and it won't absorb any water. You know, bead, okay, out here. bead styrofoam will eventually allow water to soak in. You know, you're going to, as you're paddling down the river, see somebody's um, styrofoam ice chest that's gotten away from them. And you pick it up, and it's pretty waterlogged. The same thing, even the, the expandable urethane foam, if, if for some reason you break that, that slit crust on it, it will eventually allow water to get down in there and hold weight. This, you can poke holes in it and do whatever the heck you want to with it, it's never going to absorb any water. And it will last for years. What, what, what's the material? Mini cell, M I N I C E L L. Um, and TGs carries that, um, I carry it. Um, it's, it's not the cheapest stuff on the planet, but. You know, it's, I don't, I don't know of anything better. And then the other thing is, how do I cut a hole? Some people get it real pretty. You know, you can use a, a band saw if you have one, or a fish fillet knife, or a coffee can. Kick it in there. Jay's got, I have a picture of what I've made in the back of my truck. And then how to glue it. Contact cement is probably the most preferred way. If you've never used contact cement, read the instructions, because a lot of people paint, paint, glue it together. Contact cement, you have to paint, paint, paint the boat, paint the jug foam, let it sit for a few minutes, and then stick it in. And I can literally, if I clean both ends and it fits right, I can pick my boat up by the foam that I want to go, because it's that secure. So contact cement is the preferred way. Less is more. Okay. Yeah, yeah less is more. There's a reason there are instructions <laughs> on products. It's not because that they want just to print something to fill up the blank space on the packaging. Read the instructions before you use contact cement. My preferred brand is, is Weltwood in the red can. And I think both Kristen and Holly just said it. Less is more. If, if you you if, if you put a big blob of it on there on both sides and then you stick it, it'll stick, but it doesn't have any shear strength, so it's going to eventually just peel right up. Where if you put it on thin, like the instructions say, you can dang near lift up the whole boat by your jaw. Well, and that's to say, I, I don't know about Jay, but I speak from experience on that. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing, too, is that if you do a good job on the way you cut these, it'll hold your jug in there even in wreck boats, which you'll need to dump. You can actually dump and turn it back over quickly, make sure you don't drain out, but you can, without taking them out, you can dump your boat because you don't have to bail on these little boats. Next is paddles. Jay, did you want to talk about paddles? Um, I can. So, 
in single blade paddles, and I, I, I know I talked to some of you outside today. Um, You didn't watch this after we got off the river here. No, that's not the my job. Um, so, so Zavarel paddles, single blade paddles, are pretty much the gold standard. Um, there, there are some um, higher end paddles. You probably don't need to start there. So somebody did the math at some point over, you know, you can go get a wooden paddle and, and do it, but I would say, as a general rule, buy the best paddle that you feel comfortable paying for. Um, because by the time you don't lose <coughs> that weight over, um, you know, I don't know, what's an ounce a minute, and then every 16 minutes that's a pound, you know, all of a sudden you realize, paddles get pretty darn heavy. Or, or I guess we were talking at lunch, Go to the gym and find the lightest rubber band thing or TheraBand or whatever they call them, the lightest one, and just do pull on that thing 500 times and see how much it weighs. Um, so lighter in paddles is better. As a general rule, most everyone has gone to the Power Surge blade, S-U-R-G-E. Um, if nothing else, if you decide this sport sucks and I don't want anything to do with it, you could probably sell it easier after after that, assuming you didn't do it. And they're pretty tough. Um, you know, you can see this one has a chunk missing out of the out of the throat of the paddle right there. You know, it's I'm I'm not I wouldn't want to go like this for days and days, but it's not going to just come apart on you. And the other thing. Obviously, I have not used that one in the Safari. Is if you look, stay. They've all got some kind of marking on them. Um, you know, this is reflective material. So my friend, who I raced with several times, dropped a paddle in the dark, and I said, "Well, shine your light on it." And, and, and see if you can't find it. He goes, well, I don't have anything reflective on it. I said, well, and so we're talking, he said, man, I thought you put that stuff on for decoration. And this was a guy who had done the safari five times at that point. You know, this one, you know, obviously has a little bit of A&M sticker on it left because you want to be able to know that's your paddle and pick up the right one every time. Um, Those of you who are going to be going solo or, um, or, or 
for some reason you're starting off unlimited, you know, double blade paddles have come a long way. Now, my first um, safari, the double blade paddle I used weighed 40 ounces. This one weighs 24 and it's adjustable and it's a wing blade. Um, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot more learning curve with the double paddle. I'm not sure that I've gotten it down yet after all this time. But the same thing, and Epic has kind of this become the de facto standard for water safari paddling. Doesn't mean they're not other brands. Um, TG that was here earlier, they are a dealer as well. But the same thing applies. You see it's got um, reflective tape on both halves of the paddle, both halves of the paddle, because that can happen. If you're storing the paddle, this is, here's a, what did Andy call everything? It was kind of a trick, a, a hack. Um, or use my modern language. Now. Um, stick a little piece of that gray foam in the end of it, because guess what? They can fill up and sink, but if you have a little bit of foam plugging it up, then that weight, you have adjustable length. But reflected, mine had gray because I was the old guy on the team. Um, and then that marking is not so that I know which way the paddle goes. That showed me where in the boat that it needed to be stored and in what position. So I don't, I don't want to pretend to try to teach you how to paddle. Um, but that's, that's the equipment for paddling. Any questions on paddles? I, I would just add, you might want to write your name and or number on your paddle because at races when everyone has the same paddles, you could lose it or you might forget it because you're like, I'm going to go home and eat. And so they get lost. Or if you're on the river, if you dump or something, they can get lost too and someone happens to find it. They might be able to call you and contact you. And I found two paddles this year <coughs> on the river. So one had their name on it, and we called the guy and was like, hey, did you lose anything? And he's like, uh, yeah. And we're like, okay, can you describe what you lost? And it had his name and number on there. The other one, you know, I think one of my team members found a new paddle because they, we looked. And a lot of racers, I mean, you're dealing with people, but most river people, pretty honest and they'll, they'll return the paddle. I mean, can't speak for everybody, but you know, if I find the paddle and it's got your name on it, I'm going to try to look you up and give you a paddle. Which and leads us which leads us to a very good thing is that there are Facebook forums that you all can join. ATX paddlers, DTX paddlers, HTX paddlers, Martindale Athletic Club. What and about the Texas Water Safari? Texas the, water safari you can paddles. you can follow you can follow the Texas Water Safari. Um, it's not, people don't see your messages on there as often. We see them as administrators, but not the general public. So just FYI, join at least one so that uh, if you lose something, if people start to see your name, they're going to start to realize who you are if you're a novice and, and nobody knows you yet. Let me give you my one caution against the Facebook forum. Maybe not my one caution because I'm not a fan. <laughs> However, um, if you have a question, about a safari rule or something to that effect, the place to post it is not on one of those forums. And it's really not on the water safari forum. If you have a question, you need to email us. Because we're a bunch of old geezers who don't really like technology. I didn't intend to include you with that. Um, um, we have an email address and we answer every question. It may not be the answer you want. Um, and the opinions that you get on these forums are quite frequently wrong. Um, so be careful about that. Unless you heard from Bob, or Jerry that was here earlier, or Alan Spells, who's not here today, or Harvey Babb, or Jay Daniel, the odds are it's not the right answer. We hadn't talked about price, by the way. These are pretty expensive. You've got just a regular standard straight shaft paddle, and maybe aluminum plastic. These go from about 200 to 375, just depending on the double blade what you're getting. So they're a pretty good investment. So that's a good reason for putting your name and phone number. All right, and David say find paddle that you're comfortable spending. I would really advise if you're doing the water safari to invest in a carbon paddle. Okay, you can get the wooden paddles. Great to train in. My first safari, I came here and they kept, you got this Amarillo, you got this Amarillo paddle. I was like, I don't have $200. I'm in high school. Uh, but 
finally got one and I never regretted investing in that good paddle. Other thing, personal care. Caitlin might just walked in. Back here, she's done so far. How many times now? Uh, this year will be seven. Seven safaris, couple records, super knowledgeable and fast and good technique. Uh, so, uh, blisters on the hands. How many of you have been paddling long enough to get a blister? I know. Even some of you with the first year, you come out and paddle with me, you're like, man, I'm already getting a hot spot. Uh, that can be an issue. And we've got all kinds of fun personal care stuff. Main thing, you got blisters on the hands, you got chafing on the back side. So we go to the diaper aisle and we find our favorite kind of ointment. I only brought a couple, Desitin. If you have kids, you might already have some and you can borrow from your toddler. Uh, vitamin E is a popular one. I don't use vitamin E, but a lot of people do. The, the triple paste is probably my new favorite one that I've been using, that in the aquifer. And I'll keep this very handy, probably in my phone. A lot of times I'll have an extra hole right there, and I'll have another one for sunscreen, and keep that <coughs> nearby. And you don't want to put so much on your hand that the paddle flies out of my hand. Really, by the time I put it on other hot spots of my body, it's just enough for my hands. And you can't really see this, but the guy got blistered on top of blisters on top of blisters on his hands. Yeah, there's nothing like putting too much lubricant on your hand and then trying to hold on to your paddle. It's like going to the watermelon thump over here and then getting a seed out of a watermelon and trying to hold on to it. It can just squirt. And so you'll cramp your forearms like nothing you've ever seen trying to hold on to that paddle. Um, the, uh, the one thing I say about vitamin E oil is if you use it, my preference is to get it in the gel capsule, take a little bite and squirt it out because while it's taking care of those hot spots, it's all also a little bit sticky. And so it's not going to give you as much of that, that trying to slip out of your hand. Ointment, uh, same thing, chafing. You're sitting in a wet seat for 80 hours and you're gonna be constantly moving the whole time. And if you've seen a baby's bottom with a wet diaper on and rubbing around, it's not a pretty sight. And neither will your backside be a pretty sight. So before the race starts, you'll wanna go to the bathroom and you'll see some people, if you've ever been to the race start, you may start smelling something a little peculiar on them. <laughs> And you may kind of see them walking, you know, <laughs> like the gel walk. Uh, that's preparing yourself. Same thing for girls, you know, you get your bra strapped, you put some, some there. There's also a racing glide, you can get in a deodorant stick. It goes back to train with it, practice with it, figure out what works best for you. Um, what are some of y'all's favorite two brace? I like glide. If you put too much on, man, just like Jay said, you'll be in trouble for a while until you worsen it off. You just have to be careful. It's uh, great. Uh, aquifer. That <coughs> body glide is um, it's like salty. I feel like it doesn't work well. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't like it. I tried it once. So yeah. figure out what works for you. And on personal care, Caitlin, do you want to target female personal care stuff? Yeah, come on up. Yeah. Come on up. So we're live streaming. We have to see you. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah, it, it, what did you just say? It's something you need to, to hear over and over. Find what works for you because you just heard several of us talk about the thing that we like the best, and it wasn't the same thing. You know, you'd think it'd be one universal. Um, you, Caitlin just said she doesn't like body glide. You know, I put that on my armpits to start the race and never had another problem. Um, and, and on my feet, and that's, that's it. Good. I don't want to know what they're pulling out of that bag behind me. You know, just one thing. Um, you know, same thing with clothing. You know, seams are your enemy. Um, you know, that's that's where there's always something on that clothing that's rubbing you. Okay, right. Oh, and just you know, so and an old guy trick is. Turn your shirt inside out, then the seams are on the other side, and the smooth part, because it's not a fashion show. I mean, it's 
not supposed to be a fashion show. Um, so. It may with those tights. Yeah, did you see Libby's tights in that picture? <laughs>
speed. I know other folks have had stuff. I think Kit and Morgan have a year to go race together. So clear glasses may be a good thing to have. Anything to add on wildlife or well, just like the cars like your lights at night. So that's a lot of times when you'll see the cars. Oh, I have one line. <laughs> Watch out for snakes and trees, especially with the water low and you have to go close to sweepers and stuff. Uh, I've had that several times while they're just hanging out there. You don't see them until the last minute. So Yeah, snakes. And also on the portage, when you're carrying your boats around the log jam, look for snakes. Yeah. Uh, if you leave them alone, they're going to leave you alone. Yes, yes. And then That's speaking of paddling at night with snakes, you want to talk about lights? Yeah. Um, I have my lights here. Um, you know, I've, I've been doing this a while, so I've got some, you know, LED lights that are pretty darn bright, you know, I, I could probably put these on my truck and see, okay. For you, starting out, I will make one recommendation. You go over to Apple Hardware, buy yourself a three-cell mag light with an LED bulb in it. More than likely, those three batteries will last you the entire safari. Take a backup set just in case. But you're not going to be going fast enough at this point that you need to worry about more and more light. Um, you might, you might get two. I mean, you know, they make the really nifty little clamps that you can screw to the deck of your boat, or you could. Um, Go back to our ubiquitous gray foam, mini cell foam, and you could um, have it where it Velcro's onto the deck of the boat. If it gets knocked off, guess what happens? It's going to float because it's in that in that gray foam. But you don't need you don't need to start out with anything fancier than than those LED mag lights, and they're almost infinitely adjustable. They're waterproof, a little bit heavier than what this is, but it's also, you know, several orders of magnitude more affordable, um, especially if you're just trying. And, and not only that, if you decide, I don't want to do the water safari ever again, what did you do but end up with a couple of good flashlights to hang out around the house? So that's, that's my advice about lockies. Um, Oh, you, don't, you, don't, that's, you don't have to put a switch or anything on magnets. I mean, that, there's been, there, there are entire internet forums dedicated to modifying flashlights and making flashlights. I mean, it's like, it's a, it's a hobby. You could, you could machine it down and have remote batteries, but I'm telling you, for your first rattle out of the box, three cell, mag light, you know, or you could become a law enforcement officer and use it for a baton. I mean, um, you, you have plenty of, plenty of opportunity to use that, that mag light over and over. That's, that's what I would do. And got to switch on. And I would recommend having a headlight as well. And the mag light that you mentioned have it mounted. Because man, if it's on your headlight, the guy behind you gets seasick and your hand comes across and blinds you. Yeah, and the only person I've ever known that was successful using a headlight for the entire race is Peter Derrick. And, you know, he's from the UK, so he ain't really from around here. Um, that being said, he's got about 20 safari finishes and has finished first in the solo division quite a few times. But he even has these funky little black gloves he wears because of that flash of light going across his face. Yeah. So the other thing, and this is a very broad question, is what gear should I bring? Because you can be given food, you can be given prescription medicine, so what else should you bring? I'm not going to go through my entire list. Just a few things that hopefully maybe you thought about, maybe you haven't. Um, of course, everything on the mandatory list you have to bring. Uh, bring a spare paddle. Hopefully it's a nice paddle, but if your budget doesn't fit that, just Bring one from Academy, get one of the wooden vent shafts, bring a spare paddle. Uh, also, your team captain's phone number. And maybe you're saying, well, it's in my phone. I don't need it. But your phone may be dead, and you get to a checkpoint, and your team captain's not there, and you have five other team captains. Like, well, who's your team captain? And you describe what he looks like. Well, can I call him? I don't, I don't know his phone number. So I've started with a duct tape on the inside of my boat. I write my team captain's number. Nice, big, and bold. 
So I can see it in a case of an emergency, my phone doesn't work, um, just keep that handy. So your team captain's phone number, a space blanket is another big one. Uh, so I think we're going to have one. You can get them from Academy, they weigh like two ounces, or they feel like aluminum foil. Super handy when you go to sleep. Um, I didn't bring a picture, but I had to use it as a spray skirt one year because we forgot ours and I got taped it on. But really good to stay warm when you sleep. Lots of multi purpose there. Um, also, tweezers, probably in your medical kit, but you're probably going to get a splinter at some point, whether from your carbon boat or from the twig hanging down. And then different ointments we talked about. I was thinking about the mesquite tree right as you come into the lake above Staples. I managed to hit that about once on here. Yep. It's gone now. Is it? Well, you're talking about the one little, yep. I used to run up every single time. And so we did some screaming. And another thing, and this is, I just added in because I like having mints with me, breath mints. Cover mints a natural way to stay awake. And when you're getting an upset belly, mint peppermint helps with that. It also makes your breath fresh. <laughs> Not spizzy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's just like no charge on Any questions about gear? We could spend two hours on this. So I just kind of went through it real fast. Bring something for a raincoat. Um, I mean, I've got, I don't know how long this has been Probably. smashed down in, in the, in the, the, what do you call it? Yeah. Seal of your bag. But, it, it, this has done several safari. You know, it, now this is kind of weighty. You know, the other thing to do is bring some trash bags, some heavy duty trash bags, because they're pretty universal, man. You poke a hole where your head goes and your arms out, and you will sweat in it because it doesn't breathe, but it'll keep you dry. And it just seems like every few years we get a pretty good thunderstorm during the middle of the race. We probably do one. We had one last year. But um, back in the day, everybody had a silomel. A lot of times we'll package our food like that, or your spray skirt, or my repair kit. And today we'll talk about that in a little bit. If you have a buddy who has one, it, it is they're more reliable, they compact everything tighter than Ziploc bags, much more durable. So silomel is super important thing. The other question I get is, what is the best life jacket? Get one that's Coast Guard approved, go and try them on and paddle, try them out. Personal preference. Quick, easy answer on that. Did we have a question on that? Oh, you did our warning. Okay. Did you go through boats, working boats, and repairs? People ask me, how many boats really break? You can't see these pictures, but maybe a little bit. That one's like tacoed in half. And then this other one's in the back of a pickup truck, and it's like this on aluminum. So boats do break, um, and you want to have a repair kit, which Jay is going to talk about that when he gets back in a minute. Uh, you want to be able to prepare. I think my dog is looking for. I got a square foot. All right. You want to talk about repair kits and broken boats? Yeah. Yeah. So it's not as complicated as you think if you're prepared. Um, The quick list is zip ties, five minute epoxy, a little piece of sandpaper, a um, little piece of uh, fiberglass cloth, um, gorilla tape, and flex tape. I'm here to tell you, I mean, I would, I, I would guarantee you, huh? yeah, matches and lighter fluid. So I'm here to tell you that in about five minutes at Lowe's yesterday, um, I got what I needed to fix a boat. I really thought the flex tape and all that stuff was one of those um, infomercial things that was a bunch of baloney. I'm here to tell you, Kristen and I did a Pecos River trip a few months ago, and probably less than two miles in, I bashed us right into a rock and split the very nose of the boat open. And so pulled the boat over to the side, dried it out, I put a piece of flex tape to seal the hole from the inside. I used a significant amount of Gorilla Tape to seal it from the outside, then covered that with flex tape because the flex tape has more adhesion. The, and 
other than continue to put flex tape over the nose to, because it would get abraded, um, the boat never leaked after that. Um, how many of you are planning to use an aluminum boat? Okay. Then, then you probably only need flex tape and duct tape. But the thing that happens the most with aluminum boats is they get a rivet ripped off. And if you've ever had a rivet ripped off of an aluminum boat, especially if you can see it, it is the, by God, most annoying thing on the planet because it's like having this cute little fountain right in the middle of your boat, squirting up like that. Um, this happens to be J.B. Weld steel stick. You, you probably hear it referred to. Um, other, there are other brands of plumber's putty um, because it'll dry underwater. If you rip a rivet off, man, just roll that up till it gets all mixed together. Cram it up in that rivet hole. I would probably cover it with a piece of tape just to keep it protected for a little bit. And it will probably be harder to remove than an actual rivet. Um, for these two tapes, and it, you know, I'm, I'm not normally very brand conscious, if you would, but the adhesive that they both use is such that when I go to repair a boat after this stuff has been on it, I probably spend as much time grinding the adhesive off as I actually do with the boat repair. I mean, this stuff sticks. Now, they all mentioned telling about lighter fluid and matches and lighter fluid. Um, the boat is wet when, when this happens, obviously. Um, so how do you dry it off quickly? Um, those of you who are old enough to remember the band Kiss, when Gene Simmons would come out and he would spit fire, and that was because he either had tequila in his mouth or lighter fluid. And we all played this trick at least once in junior high, those of you who are old enough to <laughs> Of remembered when they were hiding their paint. And so it's the same thing. It's not actually, are you, did you try this recently? I mean, I see some laughter back there. Or is it a, just a good reason to take tequila with you? I mean, it's one of the two things. But what happens is it generates a lot of heat on the surface without actually burning what it's on. You know, just like if there's gasoline on the floor, somebody lit a match, it's going to burn that heat up. So you light that um, lighter fluid. If you go online, you can find some pretty cool pictures of people in the safari lighting their boats on fire, and it's not that they're performing some kind of sacrifice to the uh, hallucination alley gods, it's that they're drying out the boat for, for that purpose. Um, now, every once in a blue moon, it gets in a crevice or something that wants to keep burning it, but it, it's heated up. Plus, it's warm enough that you can um, stick it you know, it helps the adhesive, like it already needs help, um, to really get a grip on it. If you're prepared enough, um, you can always get through the race. This, in the 2000 race, I tell this story almost every year. In the 2000 race, um, Don Zeke and his daughter Brandy Zeke were racing, and he'd been over at the house quite a bit. And we've been through the what do I need in my repair kit story over and over. And, and I said, zip tie. Now, when I say zip ties, I usually mean take 10 or 12 zip ties with you. Well, Don is an accomplished engineer. And so, when he said heard zip ties, what he brought was like, if you go to one of the warehouse stores and buy zip ties, it was like a quart of zip ties kind of thing. And he took them with him. Now in the 2000 race, it was very unique because what happened is as we got to check-in, in a dry year, kind of like what we're experiencing now, it started raining. And it rained all day at check-in. And it rained all day of Saturday of the race so that the race, if you were up towards the front of the pack, was not the race that was happening at the back of the pack because the water was coming up and just weird things were happening. So when Don and Brandy got somewhere down below Palmetto, um, they were on what was essentially a floating log bridge. And a log came over and hit the stern of their boat and ripped like two feet of the boat off except for about four inches at the very bottom of the boat. Now, it continued to rain. Now, I told Don if you 
you know, about lighter fluid, I told them about Gorilla Tape and, you know, about zip ties and everything. And he, he brought the, the quart of zip ties, but what he forgot was the lighter fluid and the magic. But he's a very persistent man. It quit raining, but what happens after it quits raining out there? You know, everything sweats, right? I mean, it just, it condenses on it. You can't get it dry. And so he looked at it. He said, okay, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do something to attach the gun. So he found a pretty stout stick, poked holes in, and zip tied the gun with it. And then he took and he poked holes all through it and zip tied it all back together. I, I repaired the boat later, so I'm telling you, he, he zip tied that whole thing back together. It looked like Frankenstein's monster. Uh, but that's not going to hold water, right? So he very persistently, Brandy would tear off a little piece of tape and he would rub it with his fingers until it got warmed up enough that it wouldn't sweat or condense on there. And he'd stick a little piece of tape on it. And they, I don't know how many hours it took him to do this, but he was persistent enough that he put that thing back together um, because he took most of the right supplies. Um, there's a set of brothers named Markowski. I just got through repairing their boat from two safaris ago. Um, turned over, blew the bottom of the boat open, and it's all hanging together. And I mean, they must have gone to the to the um, like sale on on flex tape because it was zip tied, glued, all these things back together, and they finished the race. So the point being, if you're prepared, it's pretty much a generally accepted thing that you can get it fixed. Um, where, where are you at? Oh, don't forget. Oh, GIA spray cover. These guys are out there surfing. So the answer is maybe last year we had a beautiful last day for 95% of the race and we didn't need a spray skirt, but you may, may not. And that's what, I've got one out there, that's what they look like. And then people always ask, why do we do this race? And I think Jay already touched on that. We love the river and we make a lot of friends through the race. So. I just want to hit a couple quick things and then I'm going to turn it over to Virginia and Caitlin. Um, rigging questions. Try to keep everything the same. You know, here I've got a pile of rivets. They're all different, but they're all the same. The difference is the length of what they will rivet together. They are all 3 16 rivets, and they're all broadhead rivets. The other thing is screws. Same thing. These are all 1024 stainless screws. Do you know what they have in common? These rivets and these screws? Same drill bit. Hmm? Same drill bit. That's right. Same drill bit takes care of all of them. So if you manage to shear a rivet off and you've got your Leatherman tool, um, your probably a screw that's too long for anything in the boat, the wing nut, guess what? <coughs> You can tie it back together, um, but but if you've got you know Winona um, uses eight thirty two screws for all of their stuff, um, so if you've got a boat that's got eight thirty two screws in it, and, you know three sixteen rivets and all these things, stuff doesn't match. So you know it's it's my general rule if I if I repair a boat, it goes back with whatever it has in it. But if I'm rigging a boat for someone, everything is common, a common whole on stuff. Um, and the other thing is what do I use for a bilge pump? There are other bilge pumps out there that, okay, this one's never even been pulled out for a demonstration. This is a Dayton 1P811A. It's on the sheet that I gave you. There is nothing, 
there are pumps that put out a lot more water. I mean, a lot more water. But other than these things that, that have been modified, I've never found a pump that works better. And back to quoting my friend Andy's word, I'll give you a quick hack. Unscrew this and pull this off of here. Take some spacers. Guess what diameter these are? Ten vertices. Uh, they're they're, they're um, self-threading, so that's not a fair question. <laughs> but if you but if you take your spacers that you use for a rivet backup nut and you screw those in, and then you stand that off the bottom of the boat, you have almost the perfect volume of what that pump will pull out. And I would suggest you find a way to screen it just so it doesn't suck debris up because um, they can manage to, to pull that out. And, but this this is the way to go. I'm, I'm telling you, it doesn't matter if it's, it's the fastest boat out there or the slowest boat out there. This is the pump I would use. And I think that's all of the random rigging stuff that I've got. So next, I want to turn you over to Kate and for G. What? Do you have a question? Does that run off like a motorcycle battery? Um, what I generally do, and I think most people have gotten the point they're doing this, is it's a 10 double A holder, pack, pack of 10 double A batteries. And so it's overdriving it because each of those batteries is, is 1.5 volts. So it's, and, and I think the technical design on these is like 13.2. So if you're running at 15, it's spinning a little bit faster. But I've never run one of those battery packs out during a race. But I always take it back up anyway. Because if I don't, then I need it. Um, that, that answers your question? So, and, and the. the I know there's different opinions, but basically the the is it over here? Which one? The blue Energizer Ener Ultimate Energizer Lithium. Energizer Lithium batteries. I'm, they're not the cheapest thing on the planet, but by golly, they will continue to work. So now I want to turn it over to Virginia and Caitlin. Caitlin, as she mentioned, has finished seven water safari. Virginia has finished. Eight water safaris. Together they are um, one half of the team that owns the women's overall record with the time of 36 hours and something. Um, I can't remember, although I was there. Um, huh? I take care of the split. I have some time off this work. Um, um, which is, is, is interesting because the record that they broke was Virginia and Caitlin together. Um, and Virginia also currently holds the, the women's overall solo record. So they know that of which they speak. Uh, so take it away, Lee. Um, to get started, I'll go ahead and just start with our little plug for our own little races um, to kind of piggyback nicely off of what Holly's been saying. Um, what I mostly took from what Holly said, just about every slide she had, it was figure out what works for you, try multiple different things, and train, raise how you train. So the best way to do that is by making friends. You don't really want to go out and buy six life jackets, spend a couple hundred dollars, and figure out which one you like. Um, a few years ago, Virginia and I, along with both of our husbands, started doing a little race series. It's not directly affiliated with the TWS, but we post them along the race course. Um, so the best way to see all these different products, look at people's different boats, is to get out with the people who you're going to be racing with. Um, I highly encourage you to, I mean, we put them on, you're going to see us there. Come to all of our little races. They're cheap. They're fun. The last one is very fun. We have a little flyer for you, um, just so you can remember the dates. Um, in my opinion, that is the best way to be as prepared as you can possibly be to race in June. Come out. Safari people are kind of unique people in the fact that they're kind of reserved, but if you start talking to them about paddling, they're the most chatty people in the world. Um, they'll talk to you until you 
just want to die. <laughs> um, so just start showing up to stuff. Go, you can go and look at the fastest guy in the safari's boat and just say, hey man, what, what is that? Why do you rig this like that? What is this? What component is this? And they'll tell you all about it. And that is so much more valuable than just getting out with your teammate every weekend, trying to figure it out on your own. Just show up, talk to people. We love engaging with people in the community, and you'll figure it out a lot faster. Um, that being said... What are those series of races, David? What are you <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to pass out my little flyer, but um, I will tell you about it anyways. We do have a little Facebook page, Martindale Athletic Club. Um, on March 22nd, we're going to be doing City Park to Staples. The first three are all 10 a.m. starts. March 29th will be Staples to Luling. April 5th will be Luling 90 to Palmetto. And April 18th is definitely our best event. It's the, we call it the night race. It is from Palmetto to Gonzales. I don't know why I have to look at that. And <laughs> <laughs> it starts at 7.30 at night. We have a really fun fish fry at the gravel bar at 183 afterwards. It's a good one. Yeah, um, there's pretty much nothing funner than eating fried fish by the river on a gravel bar in the middle of the night <coughs> where you'll be sleeping in a couple minutes. Um, so Dave's going to pass these all out. I'll stick them on the back table with the other handout so that it um, doesn't distract. But, but yeah. you want to do this. I mean, iron sharpens iron. You know, racing makes you faster than just getting out there and slogging miles out. You need to do both. Yeah, I certainly encourage that. The first three races are all on a Sunday. The intention of that is so that you get out on Saturday and see that course. Um, so figure out what you're going to do on Saturday so that you can race it on Sunday. Racing means a lot of different things to different people. It's not trying to say that you need to go out and race till you throw up or pull a muscle or twist an ankle on a portage, but you should be efficient and trying to do that race, even though it's kind of informal and fun, how you intend to be in June. Um, I think it's kind of our mindset that this is a race. A lot of people look at it as more of an adventure, but we are trying to get down as fast as we can, and that's the intention with our series, is to get you down as fast as you can. Um, so please come. Additionally, tomorrow is a town lake race, and there's another race next Sunday. Those are also very fun, even though they're not on the course. They're just on a lake, but it's meeting people. It's getting to hang out with, you know, say you want to come back next year, you're going to be hanging out with us all year long, you know, <laughs> see each other every weekend. Um, so start meeting the people who are probably going to be some of your very good friends. And the, the town lake series is in Austin. Yes, to Shores, Gardens. Gardens, and that's um, where I-35 hits Lady Bird Lake, is what we now call it, um, in Austin. So 10 a.m. 10 a.m. And when, when Tomorrow? So there's and one tomorrow, Sunday. and then Saturday. February 16th. Yeah, the following Sunday. On February 16th, we're going to watch the room try to get our kids and have all the kids we can. So if you got kids, bring them out. We'll even have some extra boats. It's shorter. It's a six-mile course. Typically, it takes about an hour to an hour and a half. And then the kids' course is before the six-mile course next weekend. So, lots of fun practicing. And I'm sure they've said this a million times, but the more people you can train with, even if it's not a Martindale Athletic Club race or a Town Lake race, uh, find shuttles and groups to go paddle with on the Martindale Athletic Club Facebook page or the ATX Paddlers Facebook page. Have you already said that? We just yeah. briefly. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, so now I get to talk about the really fun thing, which is talking to a bunch of dudes about tampons. Are you ready? <laughs> Start off there. 
In, in all seriousness, do we... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going to close your eyes because you're too happy. So, basically, we do have to... I, I joke with that intro, but I do feel like my husband's and probably Caitlin's husband's come into this race with a little bit different mentality. We women typically like to know every branch on the course because we know that if we get in a precarious situation, we don't have the strength to get out of that precarious situation. So as a female racing, there's, a, I feel like, quite a bit more prep involved. And so I would just urge everyone to train like that. Try and see as much as you can before the race because it is very helpful. Um, and then I always get the question, how do you pee in the boat? Well, we typically, for a female, have a female... Did you bring one? Have you already talked about it? No. <laughs> Photo op, okay. <laughs> It, it's going to look better than the ones of Jay's today, so that's great. I have friends that are men that can't pee in the boat, okay? What doesn't help your partner, if your partner can't pee in the boat, yelling at them what's taking you so long is like the least helpful thing. Just for those of you that are ever in the that might help for a guy. Then you two can use this journal. So I normally race with women, but last year I raced with some dudes, and they were like, we're dudes. And Jay can talk about how dudes pee. But they had issues like screaming over the edge of the boat. And they're like, Holly, can I use your urinal? And I'm like, dude, like, not the girl, it's fine. So I'm like, oh, we ended up peeing in a cup because it was easier. We ended up having like old water bottle. So it, I think. Not a guy, but it may be easier for guys too. You know, there's a lot of pride in saying, oh, I'm just going to pee up over the side of the boat. And there's, um, I, I'm here to tell you in about 24 hours, I don't care how young you are, you know, peeing over the side of the boat means you're going to dribble down your leg. <laughs> That's just the way it is. And so you need to do something. I mean, there's guys that, that pee on paddles. You know, and, and you know, do that to direct what's left of the flow out. I mean, it's um, You don't want it all over you. I mean, you don't want it in the boat. And you don't want it in the boat. And um, so you do whatever you can to get us, you know. So, you know, there's a lot of hard uh, You shouldn't feel bad about it if you can't relax because one of the best paddles that I've paddled with in the minor boat. He could not pee in the boat. We had to make him get out. 118 miles on racing, make him get out and pee. He's in a tight place back there. He just can't relax. So it's different for everybody. Yeah, if you're driving an unlimited boat, just about the time, that right, probably happens for everybody. Just about the time you're not relaxed enough where you can pee is about the time somebody screams, Right! It's <laughs> <laughs> like taking a clamp <laughs> on your bladder. So, you know. <laughs> Just by searching. 
hasn't told you is after they use this, she makes sure that they have the appropriate quantity of feed. Yeah. And, and, and I, then she screams it. Okay, we have clear and copious. That's not enough. <laughs> okay. okay.
go out. Throw it in there, tie it, put it in a Ziploc bag. Kristen, this is for you. I give it to her directly. She knows exactly what it is. She's going to dispose of it properly. So you're staying, you know, we're not leaving trash. We're not leaving, we're staying clean, staying sterile, staying uh, discreet. So. Now, most of you are probably not going to be racing at that point where you're worried about, you know, do I hang my butt over the side of the boat? <laughs> or you could say, meet the guy in the third seat of my boat. And you think, oh, I'm going to use this Ziploc bag. <laughs> Mr. Curry, I'm going to troll Jay while he's on the Facebook page. And, and instead, you miss the bag. <laughs> And the first thing that you hear from the back of the boat is, get that out of the boat. And so instead of thinking, oh, I've got a Ziploc bag that I could pick it up with, you reach down and you grab a warm handful of it. <laughs> so, plan ahead. Don't be like him. <laughs> throughout the day and I just kind of quit paddling and Tim and Zach were like yes we're gonna get her so they pull up and they're like why are why aren't you paddling and I'm like I'm changing my tampon and Tim <laughs> didn't speak because he was so mortified so that was one of my more proud moments so women you can still beat them even if that is something you're dealing with and also your body is working so hard that after 24 hours, probably it won't be an issue anymore. So, yes. I know we talked about like you can't go to the trucks and you can't use cots and stuff, but at the checkpoints where there are portajons, is that legal to use those? Yes. yes. If it's supplied, if it's, if it's there for everyone to use, then yes. If your team captain somehow creates a bathroom for you, then no, it's not legal. But there, there are porta potties at every
the ends of it, that brown stretchy stuff that's sticky, that is Luco tape essentially. And you can, say you have a line that's going to rub and you know, you can, you know, at Spring Lake, before you ever get in the water, line whatever you think is going to rub with Luco tape and then take it off after you finish the race. And that does tend to, I tend to put Luco tape right here because that's where I get rubs on my collarbones. Um, so that's a neat product that I just learned about within the past couple years. So that's a good one. That's cool. I've never heard of that. It's good. Most of the time. I've never heard of that. It's L L E U K O L E U K O. Hard to hard to find in the store, but it's on Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. Everything that we're telling y'all about. What about the liquid bandage? We use that bay fishing a lot. Like yeah. Rub spots and stuff. That's probably work. Pile that on there, like very good. I do have a friend that had a bunch of blisters on his hand, and so he duct taped his hand around Quero. I wouldn't recommend that because you're gonna have to get that tape off at some point, which is not gonna be all your skin. Over the day. Jerry Cochran that was here earlier. Um, this was this was a long time ago, but he was a carpenter for for the state. And they decided that they would wear gloves in the safari. And they were whatever the highest tech at that time was, you know, gloves that there were. And they wore these. And, 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 and in essence, when they took the gloves off, they took all the skin along with them. Um, you don't want you don't want to stay wet. You know, drying off is is the bottom line of everything they're telling you. How do you get it dry off? One thing is like at night, if you take your shoes off. Dry out, shorts or anything. Make sure you secure those in the boat. Um, I was team captain for the Cowboys one year, and a bunch of them had taken shoes and clothes off, and they hit something in the middle of the night, flipped over. They lost everything, <laughs> and and they did. Some of them didn't have their stuff tied in. Never happened. I would say tie everything in. If you are going to need it in 50 miles, tie it in. Somehow secure it. I'm sure you all talked about that exclusively. Bird, as I know you touched on it, but I want you to go into a little more detail because you do better than anyone I know about what parts of the river to scout and what to scout. Have you seen my anal antenna? No, just say that. I may have implied it. No, no, it's true though. Because she, she touched on it very briefly, but, but it's that thing of. Uh, <laughs> you know, most of us are like, oh, I'll remember that. And you take it from there. Okay, so I'm sure that Holly talked to you guys about if you're brand new to paddling and this is like a bucket list item for you, you're probably not going to start on the most technical sections of the river. So you'll probably start on a lake, learn how the canoe works, and then move up to <coughs> Once you get comfortable in your boat, I would say the number one places that we think are imperative to learn pretty intimately would be, unfortunately, San Marcos to Palmetto, really San Marcos to Gonzales, so the first 80 miles. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's true though. Um, and I can be really specific about those 80 miles. And then the next major stretch is Quero to Victoria, which is the prelim course. Um, see the prelim before you do the prelim. That's all I'm going to say. Especially in low water like we have right now. All the reports I'm seeing show no rain in the spring. So it's possibly going to be a really low water year. There are more rocks, more stumps showing more things to break your boat on. Um, and then after that, You've got the log jam section, which is after DuPont, and then you have the bay. If you've never seen the bay, you really don't want to leave that to the last minute. Um, it can get kind of ugly, and you want to at least feel confident that you know where you're going down there because it's you're going to be the least clear when you're crossing the bay. Uh, okay. So let me get specific, because you can do Quero to Victoria in a day, you can do the bay in a day, and you can see the 
log jams in a day. You're probably not going to do start to palmetto. So the rockiest section in that stretch is from the start to staples. Um, so I wouldn't make that your first run out of the gate. That is less forgiving as far as, you know, day trips. Um, from Staples to Fentress right now, I don't think it's that bad right now, but Fentress to Luling 90 is really hairy. And Stair Town to 90. Yeah, yeah Stair Town to 90. Yeah. Um, the good news is it's shallow. So if you see stuff up ahead and you don't know if you're going to be able to make it through there, then you can pull over and walk a lot of this stuff. Just, if you see trees across the river, my big thing is, especially we had a lot of wind the other day, you don't know what trees have that's blown into the river. Stay on the low side of the river. Did you all talk about that? Okay, so what I mean is, if you're going down the river and you've got a really high bank and you've got a shallow gravel bar and the, the river is kind of turning to your left, you want to hug that gravel bar because more than likely the faster water is going to be on the outside along that really steep bank. So when you haven't seen a stretch, just play it safe. Don't get in the fastest water unless you can see, you know, quite a ways down the river because you don't want to get in a situation that you can't get out of. And that's where I think that we're particularly um, cautious and on point with that regard. And to piggyback from the real, real, uh, practice getting out of your boat in shallow water. Because when you're coming up with something at this water level, this I paddled the Pinterest to Lule with some other guys, and we did fine, but it's gnarly. And most of the time, it's not even knee deep. And as soon as you, the water starts taking you, if you don't jump out right then, you're going to end up in that tree, and you're going to end up poking a hole in your boat or breaking your leg. So in a controlled environment, practice getting out of your boat quickly and on the upstream side of the boat. That's a real safety thing. So if the river's going this way, I'm going to let the boat go and get out, and the boat's going downstream, and I'm on the upstream side. Also, I never want to get out and hold my boat in the middle of the boat with it sideways to the current because then I'm fighting all that. So this is something you need to, to practice. So what she means by that is if you've got, to, most of y'all will probably have two people in your boat. The back person needs to secure the back of the boat. As long as the back person is like solid, then that nose can kind of move a little bit. But if the front person is holding the boat and you're kind of on a turn, that water is going to grab the back of the boat and slam it into whatever is downstream. So it's really important. If ever you have a yard sale and you flipped and the whole, everything's going everywhere, whoever's at the back of the boat, try and grab the back of the boat. See if you can stand up. If you can't, just make sure that you don't get between any logs that are down and your boat. We want to be on the other side of your boat so that you don't get pinned. Main thing is be top of your board. As long as the certain person jumps out, the boat will find the current and just be parallel with it. So you can hold it with one hand, but if they try to do it in front, it's going to come around and take them out. So the back person needs to jump out. Yeah, and I think all of them have said jump out before you get yourself in a precarious position. You know, again, we talked about this a little bit earlier. There's no bonus points for, you know, taking the crazy way through something. You can always walk your boat past the, um, the obstacle and get back in. If you don't do that, and you know, you're that bow person who's decided I'm gonna keep holding on to it, the boat comes swinging around and gets filled up with water, breaks, and now you've gotta go back to what I was talking to you about patching it. That's a lot longer than what it would have taken you to hop out of the boat. Um, so just bear that in mind. You know, safety first, you know, 
still so. We use an app called Find My Friends. If y'all haven't heard of this app, it's really accurate as to where you are on the river. So link up with somebody that's on land, even if they're in Houston, so that they can know where you are, so that if something happens to your boat and you need someone to come and help you, then you'll be able to send them a pin, um, get a really good dry bag if you don't already have one, and make sure your phone is charged because it's just a really easy, I can't tell you how many times we've all gone to help someone that's just broken the boat or maybe they just have a hole and they need some duct tape or whatever. And so location is key. And bring your repair kit on training runs. Mm -hmm. Even if you're like, oh, I'm just going for five, 10 miles. We had some friends the other day go out and they call me and they're like, um, the boat's kind of in two pieces and we can't do anything. And these are experienced paddlers. And they're like, um, can you come get us? And they ended up walking out. But they're like, I guess I should bring my return kit. You know, and, and I want to piggyback on all of that. I don't care who you are. You need to let somebody know where you're going. Um, and I, I just relay a particular story that happened a few years ago. I told you all earlier, you know, basically every Tuesday or Thursday, I go do the bottom of the river, right? And so I'm halfway to where to live in Katie back. And I get a phone call that says such and such is doing that section tonight too, and they, they're lost. And it's like I didn't even know they were down there. Um, and so, you know, it's that thing of their phones getting ready to die. I'm halfway to Houston, um, et cetera. And, you know, she starts sending me pictures of where she is. Well, fortunately, I've been down there enough where it's like, okay. Well, all you need to do is follow this levy and it will take you to the exit and, and you go on. But nobody was with her and, and she hadn't let anybody know ahead of time that that was happening. You know, I don't know how many times Virginia has said, hey, I'm paddling today from, you know, the house down to Fentress. Like, that's fine. I mean, I'm working on boats. I care less on one hand. But on the other hand, I'm just jealous because I can't go. But on the other hand, I know that it, I don't hear back from Virginia in the next five or six hours, you know, even if it's something related. It's like, hey, where are you? You know, I, I haven't heard back from you, and I know that you went to do this. Yeah, that's what it gets, you know, friends take care of friends. Um, but, but if you start acting like you're a 17-year-old and don't tell anybody where you are, then they can't bail you out of the situation. We don't want to have to bail anybody out, but we want to be available to if you need us. So that's, you know, I will say that's the good thing about those message boards and stuff Patty's so happy about. Um, Find you know, your friends. Let people know where you go. When, when you're saying you run the bottom, I know it says that that one checkpoint down there is private property and you can't get on it. So where are you putting in and taking out? Swinging bridge. Yeah. Swinging bridge is what you No, it's out. not no. accessible. Right. There, except for right. So you can't put in there. So where can you? You probably need to um, find a friend that has private property. Okay, you're right. using non-public access. Right. Okay. If I can put in at Tivoli and go up and back, a lot of people will do that because that's a public campground that you can just pay to park at. And uh, once you get to Tivoli, you're probably looking at three miles to the saltwater barrier, three miles to the exit about the alligator lake, and then you can just keep going up and then come back. So there's a low enough flow that you can power up the river. If it hasn't just rained a lot. It's generally kind of a pain that no matter what the stretch from the Highway 35 bridge to the saltwater river, because it's pretty narrow. But once you get up past that, it's generally not too big. And I don't mean to be dismissive of your question. It's just like I'm not going to give all my secrets. No, no, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I mean, you guys, so, there's no public access, right. there's no public access. Like if it. you don't want to go upstream and then down, you can put in at Victoria 59, and I'll tell you, from Victoria 59 to DuPont is so curvy that, turns. yeah, in, in a really windy, low, dry year like we're having, you can get trees that fall in the river. And it's good to know where those log jams are. So that's not, although I didn't say that that's one of the most technical stretches out there, 
if you do it, you're not hurting yourself because things fall in the water there all the time. And don't tell everybody if you find a log jam because that's what I said. Yeah. <laughs> you have a log jam. J for the win. Yeah. <laughs> Only I can say bad word talking about people. <laughs> secure things in the boat. I like to attach stuff to the foam, like they talked about foam that you're going to stick your water jug in. You can put all sorts of, you can poke stuff into it like, um, you know, zip ties and you can zip tie your mandatory items to it, uh, like your flares, that way if you had an issue in the boat, I mean in the bay, your flares would be accessible. Also, don't wait until like you're in the bay needing to use a flare to learn how to use a flare because you can't do it at 2 a.m. after completing the course. So learn, look at your flare instructions. Um, and uh, I know, have you talked about the bags you make? I was gonna say okay. the Velcro bag. Go back to the flares for a second. Okay. Number one, they, they're supposed to be attached to somebody. Um, in at the solo boat. In and, and everybody needs to know where they are. But I, I want to I wanna put an exclamation point um, on what she said about knowing how to use them before you get out there. You know, if you've ever turned over in the bay, um, it doesn't matter if it's daylight or dark. It's already kind of disoriented. And I can, you know, when she said that, I can just imagine myself out there having, you know, knock one contact lens off and, and I'm floating around, got a hold of these orange flares, and, you know, I'm trying to find my reading glasses, assuming Curry hadn't stolen. Um, and, and I start trying to read this thing, it's like, unscrew, and it's like, your hands are screwed up because you got to unscrew these things, and, and then, you know, it's just, you know, I'm more than likely to shoot myself in the face at that point if I'm not careful. So it's certainly worth the effort to know how your equipment works, whatever that piece of equipment is, before the race starts. I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. No, that's good. So Holly, if she hasn't told you yet, she is a masterful spray skirt maker. Don't wait until May to ask her to 
make you a spray skirt. Get in line now. Um, do what? It won't happen in May. Yeah, it won't happen in May. Or you'll pay through the... Yeah. I mean, how much money you got? So, the other thing she makes is um, these little mesh bags that are good for food. Or you can rivet some mesh bags into... Oh, good. Yeah, so you can use these for food bags, but also you can get some food bags and rivet them into the side of your boat so that you can keep your, you know, the things that you're not throwing back to your team captain. Um, I personally like bags on the side of my boat because they're, they're just a ton of stuff that you've got to keep the whole way down the river, and that's easier. Another trick I do... Um, Go back. We're up out of the water, too. Yes, don't rivet them to the bottom of your canoe, because A, you don't want rivets on the bottom of your canoe, but also you want everything as dry as possible. Things that are wet are heavier than things that are dry, so keep everything as dry as possible. And we use Velcro. We attach the oh, Velcro yeah, on each side, down. and this just Velcros on and off. For your food bags. Yeah, yes. for those storage bags on the side. We, mm -hmm. yeah. Joe's very good with the uh, cement. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, have y'all seen an ice pack? Yes. Y'all yeah. haven't talked about it? Okay, this is going to be your best friend for multiple reasons. Um, you're going to pee on yourself. It's going to happen. So, one in your lap for it to melt all over your lap is kind of nice because you're not going to smell great by the end of the race. So I like one ice pack around my neck and I like one in my lap. And it's also clean. It's clean water. So it's better than jumping in, like I said, at DuPont because it's not that gritty water that's going to create a bunch of blisters. Um, these ice packs are phenomenal. Holly also makes ice packs. So, or, in other words, or, now you just can also use if you don't want to do fancy ones. You can use both of these towels so that it will go through. Or you can use yeah. the really long tube socks and you can do a zip tie at the end, just trim it off. Um, and you can use those as, as well. It's not as efficient and it's, yeah. it's certainly more wasteful, but it, that's it's a shelf. This is com com compartmentalized and yeah. The fact is that terry cloth is not going to dry out as fast. Yeah. And besides that, we all tried to get rid of tube socks when we got out of junior high. Um, and team captains, you keep a supply of those. You fill it with ice and you offer it, pretty much starting at staples on because they're hot. And then you just keep buying your ice and then Which reminds me. So you just fill them up. Don't, don't put too much ice in there. You want to have a good amount, but you don't want to pack them so full because it does yeah, you Friction. Can, you can get them so full that you look like one of those people who's been in a car wreck <laughs> and, you know, got the neck brace on and, and... So, something that's a little bit surprising is that it can be mid-June and I always get cold at night because you've been working all day long and then the sun goes down and... You know, some people tend to pee more at night for some reason. Um, I get cold. So team captain, kind of read how your team is doing. If they don't know how they're going to react to ice in their water and ice packs, most people probably don't want an ice pack after sunset. Um, you know. Yeah. Would you agree? No, I, I, I quit using them probably about four or five in the afternoon because yeah. I'm, I'm like you, man. I, just, I get the shivers if I get the shades that far. Yeah, yeah. Also, as team captains, when you're during the, the heat of the day, make sure that any, that any liquids that you're giving them are you know, cold. You know, we, when the Holly showed you the, um, the, the jug, and there's all different sizes or types, but I make sure that the water that I put in here during the day is already cold and that the ice is just kind of extra on there and I've gotten empty jugs back where there's still a little bit of ice in the bottom which that's, that's what you want. Um, but as the sun starts going down, I'll, um, you know, talk with your team beforehand but usually we'll just use um, either cool water or just regular temperature water so that their body then isn't having to, to, to use extra energy 
to, to warm themselves up because they're drinking cold water. So you need to talk to your team about that. Yeah, take a, I always take a windbreaker, which is great. Oh, you'll do, yeah, it's yeah, a great space blanket. Yeah. Something else that's on a real serious note is keeping your body temperature cool. Be uh, very sensitive to what's going on with your own body. I was paddling once and it was four in the afternoon, no joke, it was like 105 and my teammate is kind of delirious because it's the third day and it's super low water here, which we potentially could have. And she just kind of, oh, I'm going down for a minute, no big deal. And we see her and she opens up her jacket and she starts putting her jacket on and it's four in the afternoon and the sun's blazing and she goes, I'm cold. And my other partner, we were going through, she goes, oh, no, you're not, and pulls us over into the shade and then baptizes her in the water. And five minutes later, she's like, oh, my gosh, it's hot. How is it cold? And so her body, she was overheating, essentially. And so we loaded her up with some, you know, drink, took some electrolytes, got her cooled off, and then we were good. But that, that's a stage. If you start feeling cold and you know you should not be cold, that's a, that's a sign, and you need to... Pay close attention to that and take care, address it immediately. As a general rule, the first day, and, and Virginia is very correct in the, you know, once you get past Gonzales, the water starts getting dirtier, I mean, just because it's carrying sediment load from, from up higher. And certainly by the time you get down to Dufon, you know, it's kind of like the Rio Grande. It's too thick to drink and too thin to plow. Um, but that first day, you can hop in and out of the water about, and you're, you're having to hop in and out of the water. You know, get yourself good and wet, you know, and, and I, I hate being wet. You know, if I could figure out a way to go from San Marcos to Cedar without ever getting wet, I would be a really happy camper. But it's a, it's kind of weird for a new racer, I know, but I do. I don't like to swim, I don't like to tube, I just, I hate being in the water, I like being on the water. Um, but hop in and cool yourself down because, I mean, you know, unless we've got those random years where it's thunderstorms in the day, 75 Which degrees. Which has happened, and you don't realize how cold that's going to make you either. So prepare for that. Prepare for the extreme hot and the extreme cold because you really don't know what you're going to get. Um, Anybody have any final questions for any of us before Jay starts his reading? So, uh, we talked about the repair kit and, and stuff like that, and I've seen people, you know, make these amazing repairs. I've talked about those dead guys. What, what method are folks using if you find yourself needing to poke a hole in your carbon fiber boat? How do people do that? Why would you need to? To put zip through? Yeah, you can question is what kind of a tool would you need? A Leatherman is the answer. And then probably a pair of pliers to hold the other end of the nut anyways. Your screwdriver should be able to go through it if you get it or something. The Leatherman's kind of heavy, so some people don't really take the Leatherman. That takes care of all my screwdrivers. Yeah. But you're asking to poke all the put the zip tie through? Yeah, you crash your boat. I just want to walk Another benefit to the Leatherman is uh, if you break your boat and you duct tape, your hands cannot rip it 20, 30 hours into it. So that duct tape's nice to, or that Leatherman's nice to cut it. The same with the flex tape. Flex yeah. tape is super hard to cut. If you don't like pre-cut it before you get going on the race. And I've heard kitty scissors because a lot, my hands are swollen and blistered yeah. and I can't open my food. So in my jug foam, right next to my seat, I'll have a pair of those kindergarten scissors Like you can tie a piece of string to the end of those scissors and then also like tie the end of that string to your phone so that you don't 
lose your scissors. You can essentially do that for everything. So. I think someone asked about how you attach it to talk about curvy earlier. There's, odds are you don't need to move that thing from where you tied in. It needs to be in whatever that space is. So I wouldn't, you know, and that goes with Caitlin saying about weight. I wouldn't have a pair of here. I just have a knot tied in the end of whatever string I've got there. So the, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. You know, I'm here to tell you everything should have a purpose um, that you take it. You know, my, my favorite thing, I say very funny in cheek, is when team members start saying, well, that, that just weighs a little bit. Oh, that just weighs a little bit. And that just weighs a little bit. Well, in a solo boat, not too bad. Two man boat, you get a little worse. You get in a big boat. And all of a sudden, everybody's things that didn't weigh a little bit add up to weigh a whole bunch of something. Um, or, you know, because it just, it all adds up. And we're all guilty of it. You know, it's like every one of us is going to add something to our list as a, at the check in that we're just like, oh man, if I just had one more of X. So, so think about that because. You know, again, it's like you talked about the weight of paddles, you know, the weight of whatever that thing that you never ever are going to use um, is going to get picked up every time you pick up that boat. A spare paddle is worth the weight, though. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And a spare paddle. A spare paddle. Yes. When you're training, my husband does not wear a hat every time or his glasses. And so, Protect your skin and your eye, like do the sunscreen and, and the whole shebang like you're going to race because the whole year adds up. So. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if this would really apply, but we've talked about not being able to really give certain items to the boat. Can you take things from them besides garbage? and? Once you above? take it, they can't have right. it back. Okay, like if you wanted to lighten the load. Yes, but I'll tell you, my first year, I did not think we were going to be in the bay for as long as we were going to be. So I gave, we gave pretty much all of our weight. We put it by the boat and didn't take it with us. And so we had very little in the boat other than like our required stuff and like one thing of applesauce. So one, one thing I would tell you is when you are going into the bay, even if it's glass, take a little bit of extra food, take a little bit of extra water, because you just don't know how long you're going to be out there. When you're talking about spare paddles, are you saying like one per person or one boat for one for two people? Probably for a two man, if you have one extra single blade, you'll be fine. Yeah. It's just a preference where you need to know. We take one for two person, but I think it's oh, you well, the other thing we do is, is when Kristen and I raced this year, my paddle is about four inches longer than hers. And not really, but I mean, it's significant enough to where if we only took a spare that fit her, you know, it's going to put me in a position that's going to start hurting at some point if I have to use it. So, but if, if everybody in the boat uses a, call it a 50 inch paddle, then one's going to get you through more than one. And, it, and also, if some of you are going to double and single, then, you know, comes in the question of are you going to take a spare double? Um, that's something to consider. But most of the time, novices won't start with singles and doubles. Well, they can't yeah. like singles. Oh, if, if you're racing true novice, yeah. As far as ice packs go and the uh, with water jugs, can you swap them or can you just supply water and ice? Or is that oh, listen, I, I just took a second to realize that you don't have to give, you know, so my team captain's going to give this to me, going to go, going to get to the next bridge, I'm going to throw it out, hope I didn't put it in some place they have to go swimming for it or something, and then they're going to give me a fresh one. So you don't have to keep changing out the same one. It, it's a rotating thing. You can get water and ice in any container that's available. Well, I go and I said I wouldn't disagree with her. If you're in a six person boat and everybody's somewhat the same size, you're going to bring six extra pounds, <coughs> not too much, but you need to have some spare. I think that's it for us. Um, I would just say for us up by saying thank you guys for coming to this. Um, the safe people who run safety, my dad. Probably really appreciate that. Y'all probably won't be the people to turn the wrong way up the Blanco. Um, so, 
wrap up this part three of the safari seminar on a 10 minute break and we'll be returning in just a few minutes. <laughs>